Days following his televised arrest, George Floyd, peaceful protester, Sultan Sharif sat down with me for an exclusive interview. I'm Michael Real, and this is Real Urban News. The last time the world saw you, you were being shot by rubber bullets and fighting off tear gas. Take us back to that moment. It's a hard, hard thing to relive, to be honest. It was really confusing. This is a peaceful protest. This is a peaceful protest. The cops are just lined up in front of us. Um, it felt, you know, as that black man, you, <laughs> I don't know, it, did, it didn't, I was like, why are they here? Like, why are you, like, we're sitting here Clearly, we're here because of police brutality. So your response is to line up right in front of us with guns and, and things pointed at us. Just let them know that we're, we're gonna just try to talk to them, whoever your, your point person is down here. I also worked with the government in Detroit and uh, worked with our police. Is that, is that, this, so, oh, that's so can you give us like three, like, like five minutes yeah, of yeah. no shooting anything from yeah, outside? Yeah. No shooting right anything? Here. Bang? Yeah. Back around this way. Back He's back. shooting, what are you talking about? It's not them, it's him. It's him right here. Yeah. Right, but I'm saying if we're gonna, we're... Hey, guys, take us out here. All right, so we're gonna try to walk down. But just, but he's instigating, just tell him to stop, okay. So we're gonna see if they'll stop firing. How did you feel when the guns were pointed at you with your hands up as a black male, as a black man? If you wanna be a part of the solution, go help people get to City Hall. Oh, They're not gonna stop doing that. Hey, just tell people, I've been talking with them. Get him, get him, get everybody. I'm trying to get people to Let's go get to it. City Let's Hall, get and you got get this it. guy, oh, you got a bunch of, a, 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 a bunch of uh, white guys, right, and a bunch of high people, right, people right. try like messing it up. For me, I think I felt invisible. Like they, they had their ideas of who I was and you know, why I was there, which was in their mind to loot. And it's like my whole life, I fought against the expectations of, of what I was supposed to be. You know, as a Muslim kid, as a kid who had to go to white schools because we used my grandma's address and I was too black for the white kids, too white for the black kids, too Muslim for the Christian kids and too black for the Arab Muslim kids. You know, I never fit in anywhere. And, um, and, but, and so I worked though. I was, you know, I was like, well, at least I'll get straight A's. At least I'll get to, get to college. You know, then I got to college and I was like, well, at least, you know, I'll start a film company and work in the inner city. And then I did that. Then I was like, I want to go to film, you know, then I, my film went to Sundance. And then I worked, you know, did another film and then a TV show with PBS. And then like, and so everything about my life, it was like it disappeared. You know, it didn't matter like what I um, had accomplished. It didn't matter the consistent decisions you have to make as a black man in this country to not end up on the other side of a, a jail cell, you feel me? If we're gonna be real about it, you know, I, I talk proper, right? I, I, I know big words, you know, so I'm like, and I was wearing purple paint, like red pants and a cape that said wage love that I, was my outfit at MIT, which is in a way is kind of to, to pacify, you know, I'm trying to give them an image of a black man that they're not, I had a VR headset on, augmented reality, I'm walking around. So I'm trying to like, even on a subconscious level, disrupt the office to, to at least be like, who the F is this cat? Can I get five people who will, who will try to help organize? I'm from the other side and we work something out, but we're trying to get organizers from this side to talk with people who are on this side because they're standing in the middle and shooting shit. 
So can I get five people who are willing to try to help organize and be a point of contact between that side and this side? You, brother. Will you come up? Uh, huh? So we've, we've worked out a situation with them. What we worked out is because we're now into curfew. So they said that someone over here shot something that hit an officer, which then allows them to shift what is, there's different protocols for different types of peaceful protests. Once someone get hit, gets hit with something, even if it's these little knuckleheads here, they shift into a different protocol. I used to work for the government in Detroit. They shift to a different protocol, right? I tell them to give us like five minutes to stop and stop shooting. If you're shooting, um, they hadn't started with the, with, the, with the tear gas yet. They were just shooting these purple, um, it's like a purple hate, a purple cloud, sure. um, smoke bomb or smoke grenade or something. But, but then when we get closer, we realize it's actually kids shooting off M80s from the other side, firecrackers. So I, I'm like, you know, I'm from Detroit. I can piece it. <laughs> you frame out a situation real quick. It feels like a war zone. And with that outfit on, which you wore and had it unintentionally to take some of the size off of you because you're yeah. a big guy yeah, yeah. to to take some of the threat away that outfit failed it failed um and that, that kind of hurt too the most there's some kids though in the middle of and they're in this abandoned building I, honestly bro 100 percent, i think they were a plant bro come here hey bro Uh, some kids it looks like in this building trying to shoot like they're throwing out firecrackers from the window and that's and then the cops are responding that hey bro hey come to the window so they're like throwing stuff out of the window um and like instigating from the middle there's a way when you grow up on the block where you know kind of like when somebody's working you know what i mean like it's it's a even with like a sister, like you, you can see a girl walking down the block. I grew up right next to Michigan Avenue. You can kind of see when somebody's working. And it's not like a judgment call or you see a corner boy and yeah, he might just be posted up on the corner or, you, but you can tell one who's just posted up on the corner at a bus stop and one who's working. Like there's a look. Uh, there's a deliberate. There's a deliberate sure. energy about it. It's more of a gut than like a sight, right? I'm standing in front of the line and I'm like, who's in charge? Right. Nobody says anything. They actually like looking away from me. And I'm like, this is weird. You just saw me walk right past you with your like supervisor, right. with Officer McGee. McGee. You saw me walk down. Everybody in the crowd is just quiet now. They haven't threw nothing. You just saw me talk to these people and they're not doing nothing. And then I came back to you. And so I'm talking to them. And as I'm talking, they start off with the, um, start shooting. Wow. We're at a protest. We're Americans. This is our right. Do you think because you're in the city of Santa Monica, this enclave uh, west of downtown Los Angeles, just off the coast, you know, you further west, you're in the, you're the Pacific Ocean, you know, multi-million dollar homes. What impact does that have on you being shot being tear gassed and eventually detained. This environment, the wealth, the whiteness, the Southern California image. I think they were sending a message. There was no reason to have that level of brutality with when you got kids, you got even white families and the, they were sending a message. I think not only a message to the protesters, but also to the white allies. Like if you're not serious about your kids getting shot, you better get out of here. You better leave these Negroes alone and let them, you know, this ain't your fight. I think my black privilege as a black academic bubbles up, <laughs> but it's mixed with my Detroitism. And I'm like, no, this mother effer didn't just shoot me. Sure. Like, no, they did not. I just talked to you. And clear, and I told them who I was. I told them my background. Um, I'd studied movement building at MIT and USC. I'm trying to use those credentials to even have them out of their own fear to think what is the narrative gonna look like if you shoot a PhD student at USC? Like, I'm hoping that that will do the trick. But it didn't resonate. It, <laughs> it didn't mean nothing. And so I'm like, this, I just talked to you and you just, and I walked 30 feet and then you shot me. And then before, while I'm trying to even process that element, boom, the tear gas comes in. And that is a level of like discombobulation 
but like also kind of like humiliation. Like, and, you t- and we're yelling, I can't breathe. And then you can't breathe, you know? Um, and then I lost all sense of direction. Um, it, it smoked, I think they shot, they hit me, pretty much hit me with one of them. I think it might've hit my leg or my, um, or bounced off of my chest. And you know, when the wind gets knocked out of you, you go, <gasps> you know, when you take up. And so I inhaled all of it. And then I was just, I, the next three minutes, I can't even remember. Were you fearful? It looked frightening. I had said a prayer. You know, Ramadan just ended. I wasn't afraid for myself. I'm thinking if I, I'm a big dude, I've been an athlete my whole life, I can take it, like I can take whatever they got to throw at me. I'm trying to like hype myself up like football player, like get yourself together, like your team is counting on you. Like if, you know, if you've ever had like a big game or you right. made it to, like we made it to national championships in Michigan rugby, you have this like, you don't have the time or the luxury to be feeling scared. What made you remain concerned? Because we've been talking all, all day leading up to this interview, and you keep focusing on the young people, the young kids who were there, the young white families that were there. Why did they resonate with you in that environment, in that moment? Um, I think, you know, I've worked with kids in Detroit, youth in Detroit for the last 15 years. Um, 20 years, all my life, honestly. Um, when you think of all the cousins I had to babysit and everything. And I think I see my, um, I see my family in them, you know? Like a lot of these kids, like I, I can pick a cousin and they look just like that. And so for me, I think it's, I'm, I guess I'm like a, a futurist or Afrofuturist. Um, I'm thinking about what does this mean for the future? Sometimes even with Black Lives Matter, I don't, that part of the statement doesn't fully resonate with me because I'm like, we're, my expectation of what matters is greater than their life in a physical sense, which is how I think life, when they say black lives matter. I mean, I know that the people who created the, na- the narrative understand that they mean a larger concept of life, but when it gets, when it only, we only invoke it in police situations, it gets talked and you know, and I can't breathe is a chant we say, then we're talking about a physical element, like your life, you know? But I'm, for me, if you've worked with kids, I taught in Detroit public schools, we're ta- we, we operate on a different level of, of the life you're trying to save. Were you surprised by the global impact, the global protesting, the global marching, were you surprised to see the world outpouring because of the murder or the death of George Floyd? Um, yes and no. That was a catalyst, but we're, we're responding to, I, um, I'd say three things. What are so, they? So one is black lives and police brutality. Okay, one. But then two is like corrupt government okay. and government you can't have faith in. But then I think three is this there is a, I, I call it like spiritual death in a way. Like when you look at the media, there used to be something in, you know, the Cosby show or these, these wholesome things. There used to be something in the church when, you know, there was a, a spiritual element that kept us together that even when you see like the thing with Trump and the, and the Bible, like he didn't go to church. You can go, and so it's a, there's a spiritual um, layer that I think we all need. So I think what George Floyd's death did is it brought all these three things and galvanized it into like a, we're not gonna take this anymore attitude. We also witnessed a a lot of people who took advantage of this opportunity and who caused damage to property, who removed items from stores that were not purchased. And that became the headline for a while. How did you feel knowing that you had sacrificed and had been shot with rubber bullets, fighting off tear gas, caring for the, for the younger children? And then you see a group of people, multicultural, multiracial group of people 
really destroying the moment. 30 minutes now away from the 4 p.m. curfew that has been instituted in the city of Santa Monica. There on your screen, two completely contrasting events. One on the left side of your screen, a peaceful protest. On the other side of your screen, looting and ransacking just blocks away on 4th Street, the left side on Ocean Avenue, and really just what we've been seeing over the last few days, Kathy, this is completely representative of that. And I don't blame them because that's an element too. That's its own form of capital protest against capitalism. They can't afford these Nikes, but you convince them that they need them to be a whole person. And so they can't afford to shop. A lot of these kids never go to the Santa Monica Promenade. They never go there because they can't buy anything there. And, it, and sometimes it's like dangling a carrot in front of them. So they would either go to like, you know, Crenshaw, Fox Hills Mall, like all these other spots. So I, in one sense, I, we have to acknowledge that what they are doing is another form of protest against like a capitalist infrastructure. The other side of it is, I think they are tools for the other side and they don't realize they're getting played. They drove us, once they did start shooting, they drove us right into the looters. I didn't know it because I, I saw the aerial footage later. But I'm like, why y'all, all the cops that were on us, there were no cops on there when they were looting. So they drove us in there. So I actually think, um, and this is the lawsuit that I'm planning to file against the city of Santa Monica, it was intentional to take away from the message. They could have just left us be on the boardwalk and we would have been sitting in the grass and it wouldn't have been an interesting story. But if you drive all of us, then now we're in the middle of the looter saying Black Lives Matter, you've actually brought, you've killed our message because you've mixed it with looting, which takes the focus back to your capitalists. It puts you on top because we still want something that you have. Whereas before we had a beautiful thing just by ourselves and we weren't even worried about your promenade over there. So I actually think they intentionally drove us. I felt it as we were being herded we, because kept, you kept trying to go this way, trying to go this way, and it was like, no, this is the only way you can go. And, and that was pushing you toward. They pushed us right in the middle of them. Uh, then, and then that's where I got arrested, was right, because I saw what they were doing, and I was like, no, you want this to be the only story. So if I got to get arrested, you know, if I got to go into Rosa Parks mode, j just so that at least there's a way to, like, have some sense of control of the narrative. Salton, as we're sitting here on this Thursday doing this interview, We've seen the world pour out in just enormous passion. And we know the Floyd family is laying their loved one to rest today. What's your thought regarding the passing and funeralization of George Floyd? I hope he gets the highest level of paradise. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. This top shirt with your cape was what you had on the day you were arrested. This looks harmless. Yeah, yeah, it's actually, it means peaceful warrior. I got it in Ghana. Um, and then I will wear it at events at MIT. And then I had a cape that is like, uh, that says wage love with pink and purple. So I tried to almost, you know, like as a film person, set a scene that says like peaceful non-threatening mm -hmm. large black man as much as you can do that in this country at least uh-huh yeah I mean, and the police were still frightened by you in this cape and in this peaceful sign from ghana so much so that they fired tear gas at you and they fired rubber bullets at you i i think they were i think they're more frightened when you're peaceful mm -hmm. it's sort of like all of their protocols are if you run at them if you throw something at them they don't have a protocol for, hey, this man is coming up to talk to me and he seems educated. Like, how do I respond? Like, I could see it. They don't know what to do with you. So in a way, that's more scary for them because no one gave them instructions uh -huh. for how to deal with an educated black man uh -huh. walking up trying to reason with you. They don't have, that's not in their list of, you know, protocols or whatever. During this interview, you've talked a lot about your education and I know it's important to you. Do you feel somewhat maybe duped that your blackness outweighs your diction and the sound of your voice. You speak very crisp and clear. Your diction is perfect, but still you were under attack from the police at a peaceful protest. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, a PhD program right now, so it's research. So I have this saying, whether good or bad, I'm like, you're giving me data. Uh -huh. James Baldwin had this, this saying, he says, where he was like, uh, he's like, my whole life I've been looking at you 
but you never look at me. So in that moment, I'm like, oh, for real? Like, uh -huh. it's kind of like you, you, each time you think, surely they're not going to shoot me after I just talked to you. Surely. Surely you're not going to shoot me. I just talked to you. You just saw your supervisor uh -huh. walk with me past you. Surely you're not going to shoot me. Uh -huh. And then they shoot you and you're like, oh, oh, it's like that, you know? And so for me, it's like new effort. It's like necessary information uh -huh. to understand how much work we really have to do. What do you want the world to walk away with after we're through protesting this death, after we're finished with the global outcry? What do you want the world to know? And what do you want to see change in the world following the funeral service today of Mr. F Floyd and just all of the outpouring of pain and anger around the globe because of the tragic and horrific death. What do you want us to walk away with? Um, three things. One, there's more of us than them. And by us, I mean good people who believe in fairness and equality and um, racial justice. I think there are more of us than them. Um, and they don't want us to understand that, right? I think two, it's George Floyd, it's not an individual thing. It's 400 years, 500 years, 1,000 years in the making, right? It's the, it's the remnants of the civil rights movement. It's, it's, and, it, and we need to continue. And I guess that'll be three. It's like you, I said this to my, my, my dean, you no longer have the choice to sit at home and think that you're one of us. Like now is the time where everybody needs to look within themselves, whether you're a white person in Iowa or a black kid in Brooklyn, you have to look within yourself and say, am I gonna be a part of the movement because it's happening in the streets right now or I'm gonna stay safe and stay at home? And safety is not a part of the, is, uh, the solution. So at whatever level you can risk it, if you're a mother, obviously you're not gonna drag your kids out, but you can not shop at a certain store. You can follow what's happening and donate some money or drop off a water bottle, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you, I feel like you have to pick a side. Mm -hmm. Now is the time to pick a side. And if you don't, you're picking a side. Now is the time to pick a side. Yeah. And if you don't, you're picking a you're side. You're picking a side, yeah. Salton, thank you so much. Thank you, man. We appreciate, appreciate the work you. you're doing. Remain safe. Thank you. All right, my friend. All right, brother. Appreciate Take it. Take care.